Hello and welcome to the Ratness Podcast, episode number eighty with Shit House Mouse. Hey, hey. what's, up, what's up, bro? Mouse, thanks for being here with us, man. Of course, thank you for having me. Uh, looking forward to this interview, bro. It's been uh, like a month or so in the making, going back and yeah. forth. I really appreciate you like being willing to work with us on the time and and get here, man. I'm, thank you. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, man. Uh, as a busy artist. Uh, do, all right, first question, I guess. Let's jump right into it. Right into it. Do you have a side gig? Do you have like a normal day-to-day gig or is, is art your income? Um, I do have a day job. Uh, I wish I could just do art, but it's, it's still art. I'm a photographer. I do lighting for photo shoots. Oh, okay. so it's, it's fun, yeah. Did you, did, still art, so I get to create stuff still, but yeah, that's my day, that's my day, my day job. Did you start out doing photography before painting or was that something that you uh, developed al- along the way or what? My grandfather was a photographer, so I've been around it my whole life, but I've just always just created stuff. I'm always using my hands, just making weird shit, trying to just any medium, just doing stuff. That's cool. When you were a kid, your grandpa was a photographer. Did you, did he have like his own dark room? Did you learn how to like develop and do all that? Like at a young age? Yeah. He was a printer too. So he had his own print shop, uh, that's where I learned printmaking yeah, and photography. I learned how to like studios and take portraits and stuff Dude, at a young age, hanging out with them. So it was cool. That's really cool. I, when I was in high school, I did uh, photography assisting. So I, I was just the nice. assistant at like wedding photography and stuff. And I would <laughs> hold all the, hold all the reflectors and like fix dresses and poof people and run around and get, you know, and just make sure that everything <laughs> like looks exactly my job, a professional holder of things. Exactly, <laughs> man. A hundred percent. I have no eye for photography at all, but I still was in there because the assistant doesn't have to do a damn thing except hold shit. Uh, I got the Instagram for my, all my photography as well. Shitty photos, S H T Y photos. I'll send you guys that link too. Yeah. Sure. We'll put that in the description for sure. Like when you were a kid and your, your grandpa had the studio and photography and like you said, it was a print shop as well. So one of my first, uh, jobs ever was, uh, at a print shop, uh, like a local shop out here. Uh, but it was in the days of analog before digital printing oh, was yeah. really like a big thing So we would make, uh, you know, negatives, we make metal plates and we run, um, the machine I ran was called an AB Dick, uh, is like a two color printing press. Uh, we do letterhead and envelopes and like that kind of stuff. Was it that kind of print shop or what kind of shop was your grandpa running? Like it was like the print, the uh, printer was like the size of like a room or house. Oh, okay. Oh, so damn. it was a big, like full production print shop. It was like gigantic. Remember those old truth ads, the orange ads? Yeah. That's what we print. The anti-smoking The ads. anti-smoking ads? Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> Hey, and you, who, guys, you guys are responsible for me being a heavy smoker. I was going to say, who would have thought we all still smoke? Shit. <laughs> uh, that's, so when you're doing photography, obviously that's kind of your day job. So I assume it's a lot of like show up here and take pictures of this. Are you still able to like flex your artistic muscle with that? Or is it very much like, no, you, you do what we tell you? No, I get to, I get to like create the light a lot of time. Like I have say in some of the creativity, but for the most part, talk- for the most time, it is just like, hey, here's the deck, follow this. And I work along with the photographer. I'm not always a photographer. And I just make it easier for him and just like go by what he wants to create. Yeah. I, you know, honestly, sometimes that makes it a little bit easier uh, to have like a list of, th- like, of shots. I, uh, I, I worked on a web series for a while, uh, MX Yoga. Uh, shout out to Terry. And we were, I was videoing motocross. Like I would set up on the side of the track and just video motocross. And there was never, it was just like, shoot what's going on in front of you. You know what I mean? And I would have to follow this one rider throughout the entire track and try and pull, hold tight on him as he's going over jumps. And then he'd disappear and I'd have to refocus and pull out as he's coming around the corner. And like, I'm having to figure this all out on the fly. I was never a, a videographer, but it's one of those things where you get thrown into it. As long as you can see, yeah. you're you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> That's basically our job. Is like we have we have to be really handy and just like deal with any situation. We're outside a lot, so it's like, all right, we have all this shit, all this equipment, make it happen. Yeah. Just work on the fly, which is nice. It's a good yeah. good thing to know. Hell yeah, and it does make you flex that creative muscle hardcore when when you have to just all right, let me observe the situation and find what's best. 
Exactly. And, and adapt to the surroundings and just be like, all right, now it's overcast now. All right, the sun's out. Now everything's blown out because it's mm-hmm. bright. Like, how do I rearrange things and still get the shit like in the moment? You know, because yeah. the stuff, you know, the uh, I guess the point that you're shooting, I don't know what you call it in the film world, uh, but like the subject um, is going to do what they're going to do despite your lighting or despite yeah. nature's lighting. So it's always kind of like a game. But um, so exactly. when uh, when you're shooting stuff, time. though, are you are you doing it just for one um, type of thing or is it? is the company you work with or the people you work with, they do all kinds of projects. It's usually fashion actually. Like, so it's oh, like tight. they give it, they have the whole line and then we're like, you know, we're hanging out with supermodels the whole time, which is cool. Oh, That's dude, I'm sorry. Bad. I'm sorry. You have yeah. such a tough job. <laughs> <laughs> it is so tough. <laughs> it's like they have their whole, their whole catalog or their whole season. And we shoot all of that. It could be days long, it could be weeks long. We get flown all over the world, which is cool. Um, or it could be a couple hours long. And Florida is kind of a hub for that uh, culture, right? It's like, I mean, Miami, Miami. When you think of fashion, yeah. like Miami's up there, right? Yeah. We're like the third in the country. It's like New York, LA, and then Miami. Mm-hmm. That's, a so that's trip. cool. Keep me busy. Let's me fund the projects that I really want to do. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. So you born and raised in Florida, right? F- true Florida boy. Hollywood. Florida man. That's right. <laughs> How uh, so? It's not to sidetrack off of art for too much, but uh, I assume you've probably visited Cali or or been out here at some point. I've been to Huntington Beach once when I was like sixteen. Okay, perfect. That's a perfect uh, comparison. Florida to beach Disney. to a California beach. How? Uh, what's the difference? Damn, the water's way colder in Cali. Yeah, and, for sure. There in June, and there was this thing called June gloom. So yeah, it's like really hate everywhere. Dude, the June gloom but, we love because that gives us a couple of cool days right before it gets to 102. I hear. They said like last week, I think it was like 114 with like 100% humidity. Like you can't walk outside. It's like a fucking oven. That's Dude, insane. that's miserable. I live out in the desert out here, like uh, the Coachell Valley, uh, Palm Springs-ish adjacent. Um, and that shit gets up to like 120 in the summer. but it it's so dry. It doesn't feel shitty. Like you could still go outside and like, I don't know for a little bit of time, at least did not feel like you're completely overwhelmed. But my brother lives in North Carolina. And when that humidity is hot or like high, yeah, it's nasty, Dude, bro. Like 85 and humid is worse than a 120 with no humidity. In my opinion, you have to bring a change of clothes wherever you go. Like as yeah. soon as you walk out your front door, you're just soaking Sweating. wet. It's like yeah, a hot <laughs> totally. That's Ugh. so funny, man. So uh, let's go back to, so you started, you know, you, you saw what your grandpa was doing at a young age and stuff. When did you start getting like really uh, into doing your own artwork and, and, you know, working on that? Probably like middle school. Like I learned about graffiti and I was getting more heavy into skateboarding. Um, I remember my dad, my dad's also a printer. He'd bring home these skate mags, Strength Magazine, and I would uh, read Juxtapose all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I discovered graffiti, and I just took it and ran with it. Like, I haven't stopped since. Probably won't stop anytime soon. Oh, yeah. Hey, once you get hit by that bug or bit by that bug, there's no turning back, man. I always got to go scratch that itch. Yeah, so funny. for sure. Does uh, Florida lend itself to that? I mean, I know there's a lot. There's a big community as far as painters go and stuff down there. Um, but it, it also seems like there's a lot of very... Um, old people or you know what I mean? Like what, what's the scene? Like, like if you get caught up, you getting Karen's on you or you get, do people care? Like when they see you doing stuff? Not really. Like I, I stick to paint, painting freight trains. That's my, my niche. Um, it's South Florida is really bad for trains too. It's like a, we're on a peninsula. So like there's one way in one way out. A mm-hmm. lot of freights don't come down here, but we make, we deal with it. Uh, there's a lot of riders down here. A lot of big riders too. Uh, Miami is a huge hub for art and graffiti. Uh, all the homies in MSG and DME, BCR, like big ass crews out of mm-hmm. South Florida. Um, yeah. And we have Art Basel too every year, which is the second biggest art show in the world. Right. So everybody 
here. So we get to go to galleries and like you see two parts of the world, the art world, which is cool. And that, that that's not like a newer development, but I'd say in what in the last decade, like it's kind of uh, been more of a cultural icon, like annually is Art Basel in Florida. We are involved in it. So like it's even bigger. Really? Like every artist you can think of that you like is here in town for a week. Right. And, and you- everyone paints murals. Everyone paints together. Like it, it, it looks dope. Dude. I've never been. Um, I have friends that, you know, are out there during those times. But uh, I was just like curious as an insider of the area. Like, have you, you saw that just like blow up? Did you see it grow or how did that work? Oh, it was, it was nothing like it was not a big thing. And like, you know, you couldn't walk around the streets at night there because it's in a really shitty neighborhood, Wynwood, or now it's all gentrified. But like, yeah, you cannot walk around at night there. And now it's just like there's five star restaurants in every corner. There's like it's all bougie and it sucks now. It but sucks. But is that a trip? Is that like a, a direct co- like that's in direct correlation with the art scene, right? Like it's kind of like the neighborhood I lived in uh, San Diego was like the worst na- neighborhood in the 80s and 90s. And then in the early 2000s started getting gentrified and now it's, you know, million dollar properties um, and all the cool restaurants are there. And that's where people go to go out to the bars and shit. And it's like, well, the artists kind of made that because they, yeah. they lived here when it was shitty. We just move on to our next little spot and make that cool. And then people will come and take that over too and fuck all that up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah totally. <laughs> No, I think it's it had to be a trip to watch, like especially from the graph scene or the perspective of more of a graph artist to see this like high end or or uh, gallery art like kind of coming in and infiltrating and almost stepping on the toes of the art scene that was already there. But as an artist, you don't want to turn away like the million dollar painters because now it gives you that clout for the community so it had to be a very like weird transition to go through that's like that's kind of what i did like i i i mean i stuck i still have my roots but uh like i started painting more i I wanted to do more shows and like like i put on shows here in florida all but like with my crew and stuff uh yeah i tried to get more into the art world it's like you know it's just a different style it's fun it's a new a new endeavor for me for sure and now too like the street with street art getting so big over the last couple of decades like you can do fine art with spray paint you can do fine art with uh, with mediums that were never allowed in a gallery 20 years ago or whatever and so that like causes like blood havoc shit but it's like fine art to me now hell it's yeah fine art to people cool. yeah and i think that that combination of art like being able to now have like gallery art hung right next to a piece of street art that makes the community stronger in my opinion because yeah yeah now you're not just looked at as like oh you're you're uh like lowbrow art and we're highbrow art and we don't get along it's like no that community really does blend and then you end up getting to know people And they introduce you to another person that you never would have met, you know, and then opportunity just thrives. And and that's when the gentrification comes in because then everybody (laughs) wants to be there. It's nice. We just go and shit on like all the expensive buildings and stuff and just keep it graffiti and run down. Try to at least. Yeah. Keep the property values down. (laughs) Yo, you mentioned uh, like skateboarding and stuff when you were younger and like getting into graph at the same time. And uh, I mean, I don't know. I've we're friends on Instagram. Like I've seen your work and other friends, like we have mutual friends. Right. Uh, so I've, I've been familiar with your stuff for a minute. Uh, it, it reminds me a lot of my own work in a lot of ways. And for me, uh, like Tom Yetto and, uh, you know, toy machine was like a huge t- influence uh, on me. Uh, Margaret Killigan, like, uh, yeah, she's my most favorite. I mean, I saw uh, the, the shit house, uh, that you did, uh, in her like lettering, like how she did like the slaughter. We got the boards like back here, the reissues, like we're big fans, you know, that shit was always really big for, uh, for me and, uh, skateboarding before I even really got more into art. It was very interesting to me. Um, but like, do you remember like the first stuff you saw in the skate world art wise that kind of like turned you on to like, I want to do shit like that. Mm. It was, um, I mean, a toy machine at Templeton. 
and uh barry mcgee twist he's mm-hmm. a local cali guy he was the one that actually brought graffiti into that art galleries i don't know if you guys remember the, the documentary beautiful losers yeah yep. one, one of the best i when i watch it it's so good dude yeah, i yeah, dude. i literally if i i'm like unmotivated if i i've seen it a million times it i'll still just put it on because every time I watch it, I can't help. It's like watching a skate video. Yeah. You want to go skate afterwards. Yeah, you watch sure. that movie and you want to go paint afterwards. Like, it's insane. And Twist, I mean, yeah, he's he's like a Bay Area. Well, I mean, all over California, but he was big in the Bay. I think he lives up there still now. Um, but yeah, it's it's one of those things. It's like you either know it and that's your favorite shit ever or you've never heard of it. It's still kind of right. like underground, you know? Uh, yeah, definitely Toy Machine. Like, that's uh, in the This Is Skateboarding video, America. Yeah. I've seen things, little doodles in that and jump off a building. Like, I was just like, this is this is what I want to do. This the little shorts, make. the little shorts before uh, Jump Off a Building and Welcome to Hell with, like, uh, you know, you have the little Tomito, uh, I don't know, the what the alien, the one eyed alien like character that Ed Templeton does. Uh, but I, you, so- you, you made the little, the sect. Yeah, yeah. You made the little animation recently and it's like two of your characters kind of going at it with knives and i was like oh that's just a toy machine like i i mean to me that was a hundred percent like what it was from but i didn't know if that was the inspiration or what you know i was definitely inspired by that like when he gets uh when he chops his head off in one of the skate videos i think it's one of the newer toy machine videos he's like dragging his guts along. yeah yeah Yeah, it's like big inspiration to me and by newer i'm talking like 2010 (laughs) <laughs> yeah, like I think it was like around then or something. I know it when you're talking about um damn it, I can't put my finger on the name of it. I should So what was what was that like learning how to animate? I I mean, that is a whole different ball game too. I I well, when I was really younger, I I did claymation a lot. Just like with clay and stop motion. And then I like you now just do like frame by frame on piece of paper and take pictures of it. And I, I just taught myself how to do it. And then I learned Photoshop and Illustrator and Adobe, all the Adobe programs that helped. The iPad, Procreate, right. as like the best little animation tool on it. That's what I do everything with now. Oh, sick. Yeah, because okay. the, the one in Photoshop... I only, uh, sorry, I was going to say, the one in Photoshop that you use, like, it does an okay job, but it was kind of primitive. Uh, yeah. Like, it was advanced for the time, but now when you use it, it's like kind of whatever. For making, like, animated GIFs or, like, whatever. It's not really like a full animation thing. Yeah, I don't even know how to do that. I just make gifts basically. Yeah, and I just yeah. chop them up and make like a whole video out of it. Totally. Yeah, that's I'm awesome. Like, looks and like lo fi looks. And it fits the style too. I mean, like what you're doing, it's like, especially what you paint um, in public, it's like you're not trying to do refined paintings. It's like more about the idea of the character and like maybe the, the little, uh, you know, one liners underneath it. It's like, I'm going to draw something that's going to, dude, that's from Beautiful Losers too. It's fucking Espo. He's like, yeah, I can stand by my graffiti and those one liners, they're funny. And like, that's how I feel like, you know, what I mean? <laughs> those little add ons. But when you're when you're painting trains and like doing stuff, do you go in it uh, with like with intention of doing something or saying something or is that just all in the moment? Um, so it's sometimes it is all in the moment. And then sometimes I'll have a sketch and like ready to go. And like, I want to execute this and I'll, I'll completely change it when I'm out there. How I feel. But yeah, sometimes I just go out there with a marker, a, a streak, and just hit monikers, little doodles on the freights. And that's just like whatever's on the top of my mind at the time. That's never planned. But the big freights, the big projects, those I try to plan out a little bit so it comes out like amazing. Oh, yeah. Or shit. <laughs> I, know, I know a lot of the riders, uh, train riders here, well, they'll go out to the desert or they'll, they'll, hit, they'll go in like kind of the middle of nowhere to be able to hit these the spots and they'll park trains and you can stay there all night long. You know what I mean? Down in Florida, I don't assume there's really much middle of nowhere, right? To be able to get. So you're like in the yard and like duck, ducking and dodging. Is it, is it pretty dodgy? It's, it can be like, we, we got some safe spots that like crews know of and like, you know, we're the only ones allowed to go there. Um, but every, yeah, it is like in the middle of the city, mostly. You can go out in the Everglades. There's a couple spots where you can be out there for like a couple hours. But it's like you're getting eaten up by mosquitoes and yeah. it's kind of just hot as fuck. So, but it's dedication. So we, we do it still. Exactly. Yeah. It's, and that probably adds to a little bit of it too, man. I know those missions at night when you go out are, are 
probably half the fun of it is like the the excitement and adrenaline rush that you get just from planning it. There's a spot that we drive like it's like an hour and a half drive, and you don't even know if there's freights there. You just drive two hours, and it's like, oh, there's no trains. Let's go home. Oh fuck. <laughs> That is dedication, my friend. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you got to come out to the desert. We Right before you go through, you know, the Mojave towards Arizona, all the trains just kind of stop where I live, like in Indio. Um, it's like on, you know, a couple hours from the Arizona-California border. But they'll park trains there overnight because I think there's a pass or something. So they kind of like take, take some time to chill. And uh, yeah, uh, there's a gang of riders in the in the desert uh ogs i mean really legendary like draft dudes um but also it's accessible like it, it doesn't seem like it's controlled by anybody you can just kind of go out there and check it out which is dope because i'm not I, i'm not i don't pride myself on like doing big pieces um you know i i never painted trains uh consistently or anything so it's cool just to go out and like check it out and kind of see what's around and see what spots you can get on or i love I do that all the time. So when I'm bored and I need to like just do something, I just walk the tracks and take pictures and doodle on shit. Totally. Yeah. And it's cool to see who's around. Like sometimes you catch yeah. your buddies and you're like, oh shit, what's up, dude? I got, got caught in the wild. You know what I mean? I, uh, my old man used to work at the San Bernardino train station and uh, he, there was these two older Vatos that would show up and they were like probably in their fif late 50s, early 60s. And it was pretty much every morning he said, they would roll up with their coffee and they'd sit on a bench and with a book and they would just watch the trains go by. And one day he eventually went up and started a conversation with them. And it turned out they were cataloging all of the riders that were going through San Bernardino. Spotting. Yeah. And they were, so they just had the name of the rider and, and checklists and, and train numbers next to them so that, the, and they had stuff. Like they were pointing out to him that day, like this one's been burning since 93. You know, this one's been here since 1998 or whatever. This guy died in 2001 yeah. and his stuff's still burning. Like the, mo the trains, like it's, they say freight trains are the needles that stitched America, brought the West East coast to the West coast. Hobo has been riding him forever. Hobo has been drawing on him forever. Like yeah, you, I find right. shit from like the forties sometimes. Like it's incredible. It's like the best museum you can go to. Yeah, and the train companies, the big ones, uh, Santa Fe and, and all those, they don't pay to have the paint the trains repainted ever. That's not in their budget. So if it gets painted, it's not getting buffed. It's not getting moved. The only thing they're going to do is paint the numbers back over so they can see the car numbers. You learn how to paint. Like, you don't go over the numbers. You don't make their job harder. And then right. the, your, your shit will last longer. I've had shit riding for, like, 10 years that I still get flicks from people. That's what I love too. Is like I paint shit in Florida, and it travels the whole country. Yep, exactly. Oh, yeah. There's, I mean, there's so much history to it, and like everyone, graffiti has like a a diverse history, right? It's like, yeah, there was there's gang shit in L.A., uh, like neighborhood shit. There's uh, you know, the New York trains in the '70s, but that the hobo train riding uh, monikers and symbols to let the other. Yeah, yeah. Vagrants or, you know, whatever the other uh, writers like, no, all right, you could sleep in a barn over here. Like, there, this guy has a gun. Don't go on his property. Like, there's so yeah, many, like, yeah. th that's kind of, in my understanding, that's where real graffiti kind of um, originated. It was like giving someone a heads up when they're in that yeah. area. <laughs> and I don't, I don't know how true that is. I, I, you know, this is just me being a young kid and like, like learning shit throughout the years, but that's what it seems like to me. It's like, uh, a lot of people can be assholes. And like, I mean, I get along with all the people down here. It's like, you know, look out for each other. We're all doing the same shit. We're all doing everything is illegal. So why not look out for each other? Fuck the beef. <laughs> exactly. Oh, yeah. man, exactly. So have you found yourself like hopping train cars and like head, headed up the, the panhandle and shit just to, to catch a ride when you're there. Or you, you stay off the moving ones. Yeah, I stay off of them. I just paint them. I'll ride them around Fort Lauderdale. I used to with my buddy Duke. Uh, we used to just ride them up and down like this little section and just hop out at downtown and go get beers. But it, like it the ride for like ten minutes. But that's that's it so far. I'd like yeah. to go on a big trip one day. Yeah, there's. I mean, there's some kids. You know, I I know you know all these guys, but the people that will just make cross country trips 
uh, like Same. riding freights. It's it's wild to me. It, it's it's maybe the purest form of it's it's like hobo hitchhiking. It is like it's catching a ride on something you're not supposed to catch a ride on, you know. But, One day I'm itching to do that really bad. <laughs> it's intimidating list. though, yeah, dude. Bro, like it's sure. super intimidating. I I don't know. I I would get like a state away and be like, I'm in Arizona now. Oh shit! How am I gonna get home? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> my mind would freak out. I don't know. Definitely have to know what you're doing. That shit's really just painting freights and or being around trains in general is like super dangerous. Uh, people get their arms chopped off. Right. Get like it's. Ugh. Yeah, it, it's rough, dude. And and as much as we love the community and, and painting trains and, and graffiti and all this stuff, there's still cats that are very unstable uh, that, you know, are around uh, the, the train riding um, culture, I guess you could say. It's like, yeah, this guy might be cool, but then when he comes down off of whatever he's on, he might stab you too and rob you. You don't know, you know. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> kind of brutal. When, uh, you, when you went from, well, I guess not went, but when you decided to start painting canvas, like rather than just being out on the trains, did you find yourself having a learning curve? Did you, did you have to kind of like rein yourself in or like retalk through like what you're doing or were you able to kind of have the same feel just now it's on a movable canvas? Yeah, it's the same. Like I just pick whatever medium I like, how it feels and just go on that. I don't really like, I'll find thrift store paintings a lot of time. And just add my character into that. Tight. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's something just more, it's creating something. I just like to create stuff, no matter, no matter what medium it is, drawn on the ground in the dirt or something, put, make it a pile of sticks to painting a freight train or painting a canvas, just creating. There's no, there's never been any issues or Dude, roadblocks. We were, we were just talking box. to uh, artist Seagak and he was saying the same thing. I was asking him like, what's your inspiration? And he was like, dude, it's, it's, I have to get it out. Like, it's not waiting for inspiration. It's like waiting for finally a moment to regurgitate all of this creativity that's inside of me that just wells up. And, you know, I never, we never had that answer before. And that, like, it's true though. I think so many artists can really identify with that. Yeah, we answer the question, oh, I'm inspired by this person or this color palette or whatever. But the reality is that, need to create that need to get it out is really the all the inspiration you need to be an artist yeah i'm like constantly like just driving down the road and thinking of ideas and jotting down in a notebook or my notes my phone just constantly like seeing just people walk down the street i'm like oh that's a good idea like what well, and that yeah, goes always, um, that goes back to skateboarding too because it's like once you skateboard and you see a spot yeah or like you can and you can identify a spot even if you don't skate anymore, like I don't skate like I used to, you know what I mean? Like when I was a kid, yeah. I fucking crush. And now I'm 35 and I'm like, uh, I might go to the park every once in a while or whatever. Well, you still drive down the road and you're like, Ooh, that's a sick you're like, ass Fuck, spot. That right would be there. a dope that's gap. A dope hand you know what I mean? Like it, it changes your perspective on the world. Yeah. Yeah. Same with the graffiti. It's like, I love that's, I love graffiti and skateboarding going hand in hand. It's like, I'll be driving down the road. I'm like, damn, that little cutty spot is really cool. That's a nice wall. That'd be perfect. Right. That that's hidden from this side of traffic, but you know, I could get in there and you could see it from this other side or whatever. Yeah. It is. yeah like you get the ins and outs of it. Gate spots and graffiti spots. Yeah. Yeah. Same, totally. same one in the same. Yeah. And I mean, maybe that's why it lends itself like hand in hand, like art and skateboarding, you know, skateboarding now has become, I would say a little bit more of a sport with uh, people just in general, uh, tricks have gotten crazier. People have gotten more consistent. Uh, there's a lot more competition and exposure to it, so it makes it more of a sport. But in, I think in the heyday of it, when I really got addicted to skateboarding, it was more of an art. It was like, what looks good? Like what, you didn't have to do the gnarliest trick, but it was like, oh, that's like a really cool looking spot. Style or like that's, or flow too. That's a weird yeah. spot to do something on, you know? And, and uh, you know, it, it lent itself a lot to like the artistic side of my personality, I guess. Too, when we were growing up, skateboarding was still being invented. Like you could make up a trick and no one had ever seen it before. You know what I mean? Like, and all <laughs> there was sudden, still shit to yeah, do. There yeah, there was still a trick with no name that you're like, I don't know what this is. It's like a double hard flip, so, you know, what I mean? something <laughs> and you, you could still make up a name. Now everyone's like, oh, no, that's a triple varial. You're, you're good. That's already yeah. been done. And that's invented. a dolphin flip. That's a nightmare flip. It's like, yeah, it's yeah. Like, the they, they already know about? it. But when. 
I think too the exposure of that skateboarding had when we were younger, it gave it the same like underground like uh, notoriety. So, you had to go to the skate park or the X Games wasn't really around. Like now it's like on every channel and every bus bench. Like skateboarding's everywhere. And it's they made accepted. us they made us jump fences and break into places because there was nowhere to skate. So it like forced you to be basically in those cutty ass spots. That's why graph spots and skate spots are the same, I, because we were living in the same realm forever. It's I feel yeah, like building it, parks and like breaking into schools, high schools and stuff, to skate the always, stairs and the yeah. they have the best spots. Totally. Always, yep. How many, as a kid, how many times did you ever get caught for tickets? Did, I mean, we all had to run from the cops. We all got caught by the cops. Did they ever actually ticket you when you were a kid? I had some trespassing tickets before. Yeah. Yeah. Same. I yeah. Got, no, I got got a, no helmet yeah. tickets at some parks and trespassing tickets at high schools. And, you know, yep. there was always Life. this one cat. Front, your parents come and pick you up. Oh, it's the worst. It's the worst feeling. And my mom's like, this is why I don't want you to skateboard. You know what I mean? Like she's like guilt trip. She's all scared. Uh, and then I'm like, it's not that big of a deal. And then two weeks later, I'd be skating. You know, I'd have my board back. They didn't realize they were, we were being forced to be that. If you give us a skate park where you don't got cops coming and giving tickets to skaters for skateboarding, like at the skate park, cause they don't have the right equipment that you forcing them to buy. Like, yeah, of course I'm going to go jump a fence and skate the spot for free instead of having to go it's a pay. better spot. Yeah. Like. And then they looked at us like, oh, skateboarding's a crime. Skateboarders are a bunch of criminals, a bunch of like hard asses. It's like, no, you, you put us into this scene and into this community. It's just a bunch of kids. <laughs> yeah. And we grew up and created the best art. Yeah. So one more time, uh, you said you've been to Huntington Beach once. Have you done any traveling uh, internationally or anywhere besides California? Or are you, are you kind of stick to Florida? Uh, I stay in Florida a lot. I mean, I travel everywhere. I'm going to Chicago tomorrow, actually. Oh, for nice. The weekend. Nice. Um, but I go to the islands a lot. The Bahamas mm -hmm. and just little islands in the Caribbean for oh, work, mostly. That makes sense. The supermodel shoots are all at those super luxurious locations. Yeah, and they're right there. I mean, they're an hour off the coast of Florida. It's, it's a hop, a, yeah, hop away. It's like maybe like six, seven times a year. Sick. Sick. So tell it, let's talk a little bit about that. If you don't mind jumping into your, your daily work, like what, what, how fucking fun is that to be able to like travel around and just show up to the shoe and kind of like get, I have to assume that it would kind of feel a little less formal than like a traditional job or like a clock in type of job. Right. It's bonkers. Like, I mean, you're with like a whole, like it's a, a, a like a giant crew. Like, I mean, big studio lights sometimes, like, like a movie, movie set basically. But, uh, yeah, it's, I'm so blessed. That's so cool. Like just to get paid to go see the world and make cool shit happen. Oh yeah. Yeah, dude, that's super rad. And get to hang out with supermodels. That's not exactly a bad perk. <laughs> Uh, did I see that Bluebird was working with you guys on a couple of shoots uh, a little while yeah. back? Bluebird into the production world, yeah. That yeah, was, that was really that's cool. sick, man. Okay. Good I'm on too, you for bringing him in. Yeah. Yeah, shout out Jacques. Nicest dude ever. Fucking Bluebird. anti Adventure Boys. anti Adventure Boys. Let's talk about that, too. You guys just did that collab together. Uh, I copped, Yeah, that shit turned out really good. Copped dope, a couple dude. shirts for me and Jim. I was like, yeah, we got to get a couple of these. Support the homies. Um, for anyone that doesn't know or hasn't listened to the episode that we talked with Bluebird, uh, has Anti Hate Adventure Boys uh, Ahab. And it's a company out of Florida and they do just like gear and kind of like camping, recreational, uh, utility oh, stuff. And they, they do some donations to a charity in Africa that uh, supports skateboarding and is able to provide skates, uh, skateboards and trucks and shoes to um, villages where uh, they want to, you know, promote the kids into something positive and give them an outlet to be a skateboarder. Such a dope, really, really awesome charity that he's, he's working with. Send, here. Just send a big ass box to them out. I think it's called the Mongo Mongo. Yeah. Ma Mongo. Mongo skate, I believe is it. I'll, I'll put it in the description as well. And trucks and wheels. 
we're, we're jock and i are trying to plan a trip out there it's like go meet them and like skate with them and stuff that'd be really cool that would Let, be keep me on cool. deck because from the first time i talked with jock i was like i want to go to africa with this fool when he goes because i know he's gonna go and i'm like yeah. dude i want to be the tag along because like i don't know i just to me that's like the the uh antithesis or, or not antithesis like the the pinnacle of what i would like to do is like travel somewhere that's completely unfamiliar um get immersed in the culture see what life is like for someone that is in a completely different world than we live yeah. in you know and there's the charity part and, of it too. well and the, <laughs> that's based around skateboarding and charity it's like yeah that like let's fucking yeah. go it's so rad same thing like just go out there help them skate with them and see how they live like you know experience what they live their day to day day to day is yeah Dude, and going back to what we were talking about earlier about how skateboarding kind of helped create that scene or definitely was immersed in it, look at where it went from us being teenagers getting tickets from the police for being skaters and now literally like African villages have been influenced by skateboarding in such a way that they're like more pumped to get a deck and some new shoes than they would be to get like a box of fucking supplies. You know what I mean? Like they... They love it. Skateboarding is, it has become a universal so, conversation. So man. much. Yeah. On skateboarding, it's like, it makes the world go around. Like literally there's no language like skateboarding. Yep. It brings together people from all walks of life. You know what I mean? You can, you could be skating with some wild ass Rasta fucking bum and then turn around and skate with some multi million dollar kid in the same fucking skate park. You know what I mean? And, and you get along. And you, you all yeah. have a common interest and you all enjoy each other's company. It's, it's wild, man. It's a fun scene. It is fucking wild. And it's, it's kind of sad to see some of the, I guess you could say like overexposure or taking advantage of product or people because of big names coming into the skateboard world. I won't, I won't say who I, I won't make this a fucking skateboarding gripe podcast, but <laughs> um, it, it also is uniting and if it gets like a bigger reach out to more people around the world, then there's something good to be said about it. And, you know, cor corporations are going to take money where they can take money. They're going to make money where they can make money. It doesn't matter yeah. what it is, skateboarding or basketball or fucking anything. Right. Uh, but the connection between the athletes and the skaters themselves is really like what it's about mm -hmm. the people. It's almost like skateboarding got gentrified. Like it used oh, it to totally be like the, yeah, yeah, the hood absolutely. ass spot where you didn't want to walk around at night. And then now it's like, it, yeah, Another it's money. totally. Yeah. yeah. They, they seen it blowing up and they're like, we're going to get our piece of this pie. Dude, but there's still cool or brands out there like Ahab that were helping people out along the way. I mean, it's huh. not a skateboarding company, but like, I mean, but it's involved in that. Yeah. And it, it's involved around a bunch of cool shit. Like, so he was telling me about that um, Dale Zine and bookstore in uh, Florida there. And they, really cool. they've done some stuff with them. And uh, it's like, he was like, that's kind of what you guys are doing. It's like underground indie comics and zines for people that just make them themselves. They get an outlet to show their stuff and showcase it in a place that they normally probably wouldn't be able to. And it's like, that's what we try to do. That's like what this is about and what our store is about. It's like, Give the people that are working for themselves another platform to promote on. Mm -hmm. Perfect. I keep doing it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Speak, speaking of that, you've got your shop opened up now, right? You got a uh, shithouse mouse dot shop. That's finally up and running, right? A long time in the works. Yeah. Congratulations, uh, yeah. dude. Now, trying to keep it stocked all the time. So a lot of pre-order stuff. Uh, most of the time it's like going to have like two or three things on it. Those will be up for two weeks and I'll take it down put new stuff up and keep rotating it like a couple times a month. Okay. So you're kind of doing limited releases on there, like specific stuff like I, that. I will stock some stuff at certain times. It's like, you know, people really like it. But I'm trying to keep it very limited and like, like fun art stuff. So it's like, you can only get this right now, get it while it's hot. Right. Yeah. yeah. And just like a little bit limited art pieces, basically. Hell yeah. L low there runs. Are. There's 24 of these. Get them while they're hot. What, uh, like, in the past, have you, make Oh, so it's like you can only get it once and then that's it. I was going to say in the past, have you ever done stuff where you're like, 
uh, I want to do this. And maybe you got like a little overzealous or something. And you're like, all right, I printed 72 of these shirts. And then you sit on 40 of them or something. You know what I mean? I end up giving them away at some point. But yeah, that's why I'm like trying to do pre-orders. I can't sit around with boxes, boxes of shit everywhere. Yeah, that standing inventory is a killer, bro. Yeah. Dude, we decided when we first did our shirts, we decided to do girl sizes. And we still have damn near every single girl size that was available. Because even the women that come up and ask for shirts, they're like, no, I want a men's medium or a men's small. Like, they don't even want the girl size of shirts. So if you're a girl listening and you want a Ratnest shirt, send us a self-addressed envelope and we'll see you <laughs> yeah, <shirt>. straight up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We got something to go. Let's go. Yeah, that's funny, man. And you, when you get on your own shit and you're like being creative and you're like, want to do drops... That makes sense. You're like, oh, I want to print like a bunch of these because I think there is some traction behind this or I think they will sell. And then sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. It's so uh, relative to uh, like the time of the, the drop and stuff. Like, it's pretty weird. Have you ever had any stories where it sh- shit just like went completely upside down when you were like, what the fuck is happening right now? It's on the site right now. Actually, it's a shark shits in a bootleg bar shirt. I was so excited when I made that graphic. I made one for myself, my girlfriend. I'm Dude, like, the eat my the sharks. Best. It rules. Fell out and fucking nobody bought them. Like I sold like I think like five or six of them. Dude. Dang! Give me a give me a wholesale price. I'll buy some. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll throw them on our site, bro. Let's go. Uh, actually, I'll just throw them on our site anyways and just link it to your shit. And then when we get a sale, you can just send it out. Yeah, I'm dropping a new shirt. I think next week. So okay, six. Sick. Cool. Yeah, we we both got the uh, the anti hate shit house boys shirt, uh, the one that you guys did the collab with Ahab, and I put it on when I got it and went out to we went out to get drinks, and I was like, why the fuck are all these old ladies looking at me funny? And I realized I looked down and I've got this little mouse with his penis out on on my shirt, and I didn't even fucking realize it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, it's like uh, unassuming because it's like cartoony. And then you're like, oh, yeah, I guess I do have like a little rat like showed his dick off in like this Playboy pose. Yeah. Yeah, pretty good. I'll have the shirt too, so it's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I, honestly, I like, I personally like when there's a little bit of vulgarity to like my- cl- clean art. You know what I mean? It's that is fun to me. Everything I, everything I draw and make, like there's dicks on it or tits or it says fuck you or fuck off shit somewhere. Like yeah. it just, that's, that's how my brain works. Got to have a little bit of disrespect in the art. Just, just make sure everybody knows where you're coming from. <laughs> yeah, dude. I, when I like do zines or like, I make like a series of zines, that's just like sketchbook drawings. So it always says fuck or shit or, you know, pussy or whatever it is like at that moment. And, uh, I'll put them together and release them. And I, we did a show last year and I had a bunch of like family members come to it and they're <laughs> very religious and they're like, which ones, which ones are yours? Yeah. And I, <laughs> I had to be like, oh, this one. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry about that. You know what I mean? Like, Jay, you probably don't want this, but uh, thanks for the support. Yeah, it's funny. Did you? My niece is a big fan of all the shithouse mouse stuff, too. That's my favorite. She comes to my art shows. Oh, yeah. She's just like, wow. I'm like, yes. That rules. Yeah. Did, did, did you ever experience that? Like, is your family in any way like religious or what did you have any pushback doing the things that you wanted to do in art and stuff? Um, I, I never let it get to me. Like there was definitely like talks like, Oh, you shouldn't do graffiti. You shouldn't skateboard. You should go to college. I was just like, yeah, I'm going to do what I want to do. Like, I'm just like, this is me. I'm yeah. going to be my own person. Oh yeah. That's cool that you were able to just counter it. Like, yeah, you know, understand that and not feel intimidated or guilty for doing what you want to do. Yeah. Cause you know, super supportive of everything I do. They love coming to the shithouse mouse art shows. They love all the shirts. They're just like, oh, can you not put dicks on it? I'm like, no, I'm going to do it. Sorry. <laughs> it's, no, that's funny. Kind it's of funny to me. <laughs> no, that's tight, man. I, I was lucky enough to grow up with supportive parents as well. And when they, when I told my folks I wasn't going to college, I was going to go on tour with my band. They like looked at me. Are you sure? <laughs> and it was like, yeah, like, okay, go enjoy your life. You know what I mean? And like, to me, I feel like I'm one out one out of a hundred people that have gotten that type of answer and support from their folks when it came from like, oh no, you want to do art, you want to create, you want to be a musician, go do it, live your dream and enjoy it. But no, 
it's probably going to be short lived and you probably need a backup plan. And you know what I mean? They were always very supportive, but very like, but make sure that you don't end up on the street. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. And I, I honestly think that has a lot that plays a much bigger role than most people give it credit for is to have that support at home when you're an artist, whether it be a graph artist. Yeah, man. Like there's, there's nothing like having somebody tell you good job when you know yeah. that you didn't make any money that today and you didn't do anything productive as far as society's concerned. And you spent seven hours priming a canvas to get ready for a fucking painting that you're going to do. And someone comes in and tells you like, Hey, you're, you're doing great. Keep up the good work. That's fucking goes so far in life, man. Yeah. Everyone's got to look out for each other and keep the support, man. Like that's, that's how you go. That's how you can help anybody out with anything. It's so true, man. And I, I feel like we kind of cultivate that like here at Ratness, like, like you, we got together with you because we talked to Bluebird and he was like, this is my boy. He's a good guy. You guys are good guys. Like you could probably work out well together. And it's that same, like when you hear someone go good job or they say, Hey, actually this person might work too. And they, that's the, even better than a good job. You know, now they're saying, not only do I like what you're doing, I want to actually offer something to help. And like, that's that community. And I know it's the same in the writing community and the art community to different degrees, depending on your, you know, your little clicks or whatever, but, uh, cultivating that kind of a, a big up of your homies, like at all times is I think should be way more important to, to every artist. Like you're not going to succeed if you're not helping other people succeed is the way that I look at it. Exactly. And with you're at the top alone with the points being there, you got to enjoy it with all your homies and your friends. Hell yeah. hundred percent, bro. That's what 100%. makes it fun, man. All right, dude, before we get out of here, I know you got to get out of here pretty quick, but uh, let's talk uh, what you got going on currently, what you have coming up, whatever you want to shout out. We'll go over all the links and stuff, but uh, th go for it. Think. Um, shit. Let me think. <laughs> uh, Put you on the spot. Buddy, Wyatt Hamilton and I, we have a show that we we're trying to do annually. It's called Shiitake, S-H-T-Y-K. Uh, we're doing it again at Rock Sands in Fort Lauderdale. I think November we're trying to aim for. But it's a sick ass show. We take over the whole bar, got drink specials, arcade games, art, music, DJs, food. Um, what else? That's pretty much the online store. That's it. <laughs> online store with limited stuff too. So oh, make sure that you get there sooner than later. Year. Oh yeah. Um, last, last thing, I guess I, I'm going to throw in there. Um, this is kind of cheesy, but since you're shit house mouse and I'm rat, um, we should do a zine together and call it mouse rat or something. Yeah. <laughs> we definitely got to talk more. I'm always, I'm big on collaborations. I love collaborating with like all my homies and new homies, you guys. So i definitely would love to. Yeah, dude. I, I think our, our shit would work well together and, uh, we can go about it uh, in any way, you know, maybe I send some pieces to you, you add to them, you send yeah. some pieces to me, I'll add to them and we'll do our own individual shit too and kind of just see where it goes or something. But when I look at your work, I see a lot of like the same influences I think that I see in my own. So yeah, awesome. fucking pleasure talking to you, bro. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. Add links or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I, uh, I missed that. It cut out for a second. Shithousemouse.shop and shithousemouse Instagram. That's basically it. Word. Cool. Well, yeah, we'll make sure that we got those in the descriptions down below for everyone to click on. Uh, make sure if you're listening, go check it out because like you said, limited release stuff. You want to make sure you get what's there uh, when it's there. And uh, go cop the last of the anti-hate shithouse yeah. boys uh, merch collab. Um, I think there's still some shirts and stuff available. Um, the beach cleanup bags and, and t-shirts are, they're sick as hell. Awesome, man. Well, thanks again for, for sitting down with us, making the time, bro. It really, it really was a very enjoyable conversation. Appreciate you. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, man. Thank you. Give me Absolutely. one second. I'm gonna do a little outro and then I'm going to talk to you for one more sec. Cool. This has been another episode of the Ratness podcast. You can catch us every week on YouTube for video and anywhere you stream your podcast for the audio. Go to ratnessstickerco.com for print zines, comics, stickers, and more. And if you have any questions, ask Jim. Jim? I'll answer your questions. Bye.